Um, the panel's been moderated by Puma, Puma um, Kimis, who's the Deputy Marketing Director at, I'll always get this wrong, UMFIF. Well UMFIF. UMFIF, there we go. <laughs> UMFIF. Let's get some oomph in this, uh, which is the official monetary and financial institution <laughs> forum, an independent think tank uh, for central banking, economic policy, and public investment. And I last saw Puma skillfully uh, uh, moderate the session at the Indonesian <laughs> uh, 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 embassy recently, where, the, where it was very tricky. The slides were very small and full of detail, so I think you did very well on that. So without further ado, um, if we can kick off with uh, the outlook for Southeast Asian growth, uh, where are the investment opportunities and what's, what should business be prepared for? Puma. Thank you very much indeed. And a uh, round of applause if I may to welcome the panel uh, onto the stage. Uh, who... <laughs> Only in a uh, British and ASEAN relationship will people be welcomed onto the panel. There's so much hospitality and generosity in the room. So... Thank you very much for that. Um, but also only in a British and ASEAN relationship will you see such nimble acquisition and movement of panels. So thank you for your uh, patience with us and thank you for the, for the, uh, for the uh, organizers for hosting such an incredible forum. So I'd like to build on some of the excellent uh, words and phrases that our ambassadors from the Philippines and, and from Malaysia have shared, and also the Secretary of State. There's just a huge amount of goodwill in this relationship between the UK and ASEAN, which we would like to build on. Our panel is focused on the uh, outlook for Southeast Asian growth and what are the investment opportunities and what should businesses be prepared for. For those of you who are in the audience who are looking to better understand what has been uh, the, the path that has been paved by business leaders here, what have been the, the examples set by previous and uh, big British businesses in venturing out to Asia, we will absolutely cover that. Equally, we will cover the macroeconomic trends and what are uh, the Asian governments and institutions doing to make sure ASEAN is an approachable uh, business uh, economic community. So first of all, let me introduce my panelists very quickly. Uh, their CVs go on for pages and pages, so you'll see them uh, in the reams or decks that you have in front of you. So I'll attempt to summarize it in about 20 seconds each, if I may. So I'll start first with uh, Her Excellency Fu Shi Xia. Um, if I may call her Chisya, and uh, she is the Singaporean High Commissioner from Singapore to the UK, and she looks after not only uh, the United Kingdom, but also Iceland and Ireland. We won't press on on the Brexit negotiations or uh, any other further determining factors with Iceland, but uh, we will press on with the positive impact that, that may be led uh, and has been built on uh, with the ASEAN community thus far. Um, GCR has, has, has been in the UK for about three years now uh, and has, if I may personally state, that you've made a remarkable impact in improving the connectivity between Britain and, and Singapore and more broadly ASEAN. Um, being a business that has uh, built up uh, efforts and uh, organizational structures in the region, so thank you for that. Uh, I'll move on then swiftly to Matt Kavner from Prudential PLC, uh, no, no uh, foreign name to all of you in this room, having a, a two-century-old two, well, two century business uh, focused on uh, healthcare, on uh, life insurance, and, and investment services in Asia. Uh, if I may again uh, compliment you, actually, eSpring Investments, which has been set up in Asia, makes a huge, huge effort and a huge, uh, has made a huge footprint in the region to encourage and foster investment um, in the region. And finally, if I may go to um, Vivek Tucker, if I, if I pronounce that rightly, um, is, who is a non-executive director at Corn Foods and more broadly Monday Nissan, based uh, and headquartered in the Philippines, but also has set up an ASEAN hub in different parts of ASEAN. So uh, a big business, again, invested in the region uh, with agriculture, with food, with retail, uh, a conglomerate, really. And so uh, no more, uh, I would like to say, uh, there's lots of background here in economics and politics and finance, uh, all of which you can quiz the panelists later, but that, that is it. So we'll start off straight away uh, to, to bookend the discussions first from a macro point of view. We will then 
fits in quite nicely into demographic developments and eventually to businesses and how can businesses uh, play a more important role in ASEAN. Um, so if I may, Chisya, uh, for you to start off with, g give us an overview of some of the um, developments thus far, certainly by the various presidents of, of the ASEAN community. Uh, 50 years now, the Filipino president <coughs> thus far, Singapore will be taking over the presidency next year. So you could give us a brief overview of that. But what is the macroeconomic trend in ASEAN to encourage investors from the UK and also Europe to spend more time in the region? Thank you. Thank you, Puma. And thank you very much, UKABC, Kevin and Ross, um, for organizing this I would say probably the first such meeting between UK and ASEAN and hopefully um, the first of more to come. And of course, I, I'm, I'm sure I speak on behalf of more, all my ASEAN colleagues in, in expressing that sentiment. Um, we, well, the, the panel was supposed to focus on investments and um, my colleagues have already mentioned some of these uh, macro figures and I won't want to repeat them. Um, but, and the audience is, would be familiar with the fact that ASEAN has attracted more investment collectively as 10 countries than China um, for the last four years, since 2013. Um, and some of you might not have heard that um, the US and has invested more in ASEAN. Um, and it's important to, to bear that in mind. More in ASEAN than China, India, Japan and South Korea combined. Um, so something must be going on in here that uh, you know, the US is doing so much uh, in ASEAN, um, the rest of the world is doing so much in ASEAN uh, compared to what normally people think about when they think of growing Asia, of China and India, and quite often um, for some reasons Southeast Asia and ASEAN is forgotten. Um, so it's great that we have this wonderful audience here um, this afternoon. Uh, I hope that UK ABC in subsequent um, sessions, and unfortunately the Secretary of State is not here, would give you even more resources <laughs> to organize b bigger sessions. Uh, and our participation list will be much longer than the, the two-pager here in, in future years. Uh, because clearly others are interested in ASEAN. Um, and why is, and it's, it's definitely worthwhile for UK and, and the European Union to look more into the opportunities in ASEAN. Um, what are the areas of, why, why is ASEAN successful? I think there is a huge integration project that is ongoing. Um, ASEAN has become a community in 2015. It is not the European Union form of community, uh, given the diversity in ASEAN and for a whole variety of reasons, we proceed in a different pace. Uh, but the reality is that collectively we are a large population, but we are also a very large growing middle class. Um, at the moment, the middle class is about 172 million people, but will be growing to 425 million people um, in 2030. So that is comparable to the middle class um, in China and in India in 2030 using the same benchmark. Uh, the demographics compared to perhaps a country like China uh, is much more favorable. Uh, even now um, and in 2020, the medium age would be about 33 years old um, in ASEAN. And um, there is huge growing urbanization in Southeast Asia as well, uh, which means that traditionally ASEAN has been looked at as a production base. Uh, in many companies, you have a ASEAN plus, sorry, a China plus one strategy, and the plus one then tends to be one of the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, but ASEAN really should now be looked upon uh, as a consumer base. It's not just a production base for cheap labor. Um, but there is higher growing household income, there is higher individual income and disposable income, um, such that there are huge opportunities for consumer spending, not just in goods, but increasingly in services as well, uh, in terms of lifestyle, uh, F&B, retail. And amongst that, I think I just wanted to, to touch specifically on e-commerce uh, and the digital economy. The fact that um, there, are, there, are, there is rapid adoption of technology in Southeast Asia uh, and a very widespread adoption such that we have 630 million people but we have 700 million digital accounts <laughs> which means that uh, m many of us um, hold two at least two digital devices dig um, and the, the, the adoption is, is extremely high and 
the digital market in ASEAN is expected to grow sixfold from $200 billion um, to, to $200 billion by 2025. Um, and the growth will be primarily in e-commerce, in online gaming, uh, as well as online advertising as well. And this high mobile penetration rate, uh, which is coupled with actually unbanked population, also presents opportunities uh, in fintech, as well as digital payment solutions uh, in, in our countries. But the other side of this growing digitalization of our economy is, of course, the fact that um, we need to maintain strong cybersecurity, uh, as well as have the ability to tackle cy cyber crimes, which means that there'll be a lot of other kinds of solutions that will be needed in Southeast Asia. The other big growth area that is worth looking at is um, infrastructure development. Um, for a very long time, we have had what we call ASEAN Master Plan in Connectivity uh, since, since 2010, and it, it is a plan that would last us to 2025 and will be updated. Uh, and this connectivity in joining the 10 countries in Southeast Asia is not just about hard physical connectivity, uh, but also the so-called soft connectivity in terms of digital um, people-to-people, you know, leisure travel, and all sense of the words in terms of, of connectivity. And the rapid urbanization as well as the industrialization will drive demand for infrastructure investment. Um, and you know, we can give you lots of figures and many of the um, institutions that are helping with some of this infrastructure development uh, whether through the Asian Development Bank or the more newly established AIIB. Um, but there are also other mechanisms, um, including what the Secretary of State has spoken about on UK finance. Uh, and some of these solutions uh, is something that we are beginning to explore um, that gives access to SMEs, uh, but working with local partners or, or ASEAN partners to assess some of that financing in order to do infrastructure um, financing as well. So you're talking about roads, you're talking about railways, you're talking about utilities, because with growing urbanization, you have increased need for clean water, you have increased need for, for energy, for power supplies, um, and the, the rapid growth in, in um, air travel as well is, um, is, is quite phenomenal, that out of the top 10 uh, con air connections between the world, <laughs> Um, three of them are in Southeast Asia, and the number two in the world is between Singapore and Jakarta. Um, the number, number six, sorry, number fourth in the world is between Singapore and Kuala Lumpur, and the number eight is between Singapore and Bangkok. Um, so the intensity of flights within Southeast Asia uh, is amongst the highest and most intense in, in the world, which means that there will be um, lots of opportunities for um, low-cost carriers, uh, for airport development and the related infrastructure as well. So, so these are the opportunities. Uh, there are many more, of course, but I thought I would just highlight two specific ones. Um, but there are also, of course, challenges, the fact that it remains as we integrate a very diverse market. Uh, we are breaking down the barriers. We are trying to harmonize more of the regulations um, to make it easier for companies to come in. But there was still, inevitably, even in a very large country, different local conditions. So as the Secretary of State has mentioned as well, you need local partners. Uh, and in some ways, you need a place in which it can give you an in-depth uh, market experience, a talent pool that is instinctively familiar with the ASEAN con consumer sentiments, um, and, and the regional connectivity that I spoke about, the, the, the flight connectivity and the different kind of transport connectivity. Uh, there are many places in ASEAN that can provide the hub, of course. You know, it could be in Kuala Lumpur, in Jakarta, in Manila, and elsewhere. Uh, and of course, Singapore as well. Uh, given that um, you know, we are not a low-cost destination, um, but there are certain advantages in terms of the ease of doing business, the rule of law, uh, and the clear regulation that, that we provide. Um, we are also not, if just speaking about Singapore as a, as a market, we are not a very large market. Um, but it is also very small, such that it could be a, a laboratory for companies to test out some of their products. Uh, and if successful in Singapore, you could then scale up to the rest of Southeast Asia as well. Um, and increasingly, uh, there is a, a very large startup ecosystem in Singapore, both in terms of companies 
as well as venture capital funds that have been coming in, uh, in, in a very large way and you know, there are many opportunities for, for that scaling up. Given the very young demographics, uh, it means that people are very eager uh, and, and willing to, to innovate and change as well. With that, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency. That, that's uh, a quick round robin coverage of all kinds of topics there. So maybe we can just drill, drill into the startup environment. I'm really interested in that just because the demographics we've heard, you know, 630 million, I have 650 million of the population, essentially about equivalent to 10% of world population. That, that's what we are. We're a big market. Um, united and collectively, we're a big market. But I've, tr I am Malaysian, as, as many of you may know, uh, and uh, having traveled to, to Singapore, to Malaysia, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Indonesia, Korea, wh wherever we may be in ASEAN, uh, there's such a big hub for startup environment. So I wanted to just focus on that. What are the sort of things that uh, ASEAN can be doing better to encourage an even more vibrant startup environment? And how can we uh, leverage off of the expertise, the experiences, which the Secretary of State mentioned, for example, given the British connection for many ASEAN countries? Well, I think many startups um, have very good ideas, but usually the main concern is always about funding. <laughs> um, so if, and the, one of the interesting things about startup um, environment is that Previously, when we look at the, the whole value chain of developing enterprise, you, know, you start from micro to small to medium, and then you become global and international. Uh, but in a very startup environment, you could actually be global instantly. You can be very small, but you can be instantly global. Um, but how do you then assess the financing and the funding to, in order to, to do that and to scale out? Uh, and any such company with global ambitions would then go to the United States or perhaps here in Europe to get the funding. Um, so what you actually require is more of the funding community uh, coming to Southeast Asia um, to test bait it, to mentor um, some of these en uh, enterprises and, and, and scale up from Asia, given that a large part of the consumer market actually could be in Asia and Southeast Asia itself. Um, and I think the Secretary of State was completely right when he says that it's not just about buying goods and services. A lot of it is about the expertise, the experience um, that the UK can bring on board. And one of the things that, for example, we have done is that um, there's this startup in a way called um, Enterprise uh, Entrepreneur First, uh, which has a quite an interesting concept in which they do not believe that you need to have an idea uh, in order to, to scale up. What they actually then emphasize, which is actually quite a Singaporean concept, is that you need to find the talent. Uh, so in a way similar to what they were described in the intelligence agencies, they look around for talent around the world, they tap them on their back and say, why don't you join um, Entrepreneur First? Because you have the talent, and I'm going to make sure that you, through a, a certain mentorship uh, and collaboration with, in the multidisciplinary way, will find the right idea. Uh, and that's something that we have brought to Singapore with a lot of Southeast Asian participants in this data as well. That, that's absolutely brilliant. Mm. Thank you, Your Excellency. I mean, in this kind of weather, just as the Secretary of State was reminiscing about getting out to Asia, I'm thinking about James Bond, based on all <laughs> the things you're, you're saying there, Your Excellency. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's hugely helpful. So maybe we can blend in quite nicely into some of the efforts you've undertaken. Matt, obviously you're not a startup, uh, but t t talk us through some of the opportunities you've seen out in, in Asia as a business, but also what are the sort of uh, challenges you are overseeing at, at a time when Britain itself, absolutely they are, there's good news coming out of the government, but there's also not so good news. Um, we are stable yet, not on stable ground for the future. So. How are you bearing all of these moving parts and elements for the decision-making process being out in ASEAN? Thank you. Um, ambassadors, High Commissioners, uh, other distinguished guests, and, and ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here representing Prudential, and Prudential is very pleased to be supporting this event and more generally to be, to be to having supported UK-ASEAN uh, dialogue on, on economics and business for some years. Um, as you say, we are, we are not a startup. Uh, we've been around for uh, almost a couple of hundred years, based here in London. Um, but for quite a few years now, over half our customers across the world have actually been in Asia. Um, we've been in Singapore for, and, and, and Malaysia for, for around 80 years, and in many other ASEAN countries for about 20 years. And in the last 
five years, we've, we've started um, operating in Cambodia and Laos, uh, and we're now also exploring the possibility of, of getting a license in Myanmar. So um, our routes in ASEAN are deep and wide, um, and we also have, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, East Spring, our, our Asian asset manager, uh, which now has about $170 billion of assets under management, and over half of that is managed in ASEAN. Um, so it's very much a, an ASEAN-focused business. Um, we are very optimistic about the medium to long term in, in ASEAN. Um, as as uh, several speakers have, have commented, uh, you, you know, with average growth rates of 5%, if you're used to, to thinking about um, Europe and the UK and the US uh, talking about how to get their growth rates up to to 3% over the last few years, a, a region which consistently talks about the 5 to 10 range um, is, is a whole different, whole different game. Um, the demography has already been touched on. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously a, a large growing population. Um, working age population is growing, middle class is growing, urbanization is continuing. All of these are very positive uh, for, for the economy and for businesses like ours. There are obviously challenges in the demography as well. Um, you know, the, the, the question of, of how we cope with an aging society is a very live policy question here in the UK. Uh, in, in under 10 years, uh, one, in, one in five of, of the population here will be over 65. Um, actually though, that, that will be happening at around the same time in some ASEAN countries, um, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. It will be happening, happening at different times, slightly different times, but one of the, the key points is that the pace at which that is happening in ASEAN will be much faster than in the UK. Uh, a change moving from a situation where one in 10 of the, of, the, of the population is over 65 to one in five, which is a big change, will have taken the UK about 75 years many ASEAN countries, it will be more like 15, 20 years that it will, ta that it will take. Um, so when that happens, it, it, you know, it's not so much the fact of an ageing population, which I think everybody is preparing for, it's the, it's the scale and pace of it. Now, you know, it's, it's mixed. Um, I think sometimes in policy circles, when people talk about ageing, it's all about the downside. But you know, I think we should remember that, broadly speaking, uh, everybody living longer is a good thing. Um, and also there are a lot of opportunities for businesses. Um, a lot of research at the moment showing how uh, the aging population is changing consumer patterns. Um, elderly consumers are now much bigger spenders than they used to be a few decades ago. Um, but for us, for a company like Prudential, it's about helping people at an earlier stage of their life when they're, when they're working to prepare for retirement and make sure that they can um, they can fund a, a, comfortable, a comfortable retirement. And that is something, it's a combination of that, long-term savings helping you prepare for retirement, but also um, as societies get older, one of the things that definitely happens is that the amount societies spend on healthcare and the amount individuals spend on healthcare will radically increase. We're talking about a five-fold increase in the amount um, countries are spending on healthcare over a, a number of decades. And how that burden can be shared between individuals and families and governments and the private sector is one of the key questions facing, um, facing you know, all countries, whether that's UK and Europe, the US or, or ASEAN. Um, but you know, that too is, 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 is an opportunity. It's, it's not just an opportunity for, for insurers, uh, health insurance and life insurance like Prudential, but in terms of serving more customers. Um, and it's, the case that it's still the case that you know, uh, roughly half the levels of insurance across ASEAN as a whole, obviously, th th that there are in the UK or Europe. Obviously, that, that varies a lot, as everybody uh, always rightly points out. This is a very varied community, and, and you know, some members have got <coughs> rates similar or even higher than the, the UK and, and Europe, others much lower, but, but broadly speaking, roughly half. Um, and a much higher proportion of healthcare expenditure is, is out of pocket is taken out of, out of savings or, or everyday expenses, and that, I think, um, will have to change over the years ahead. But the other side of this, um, this story is what happens to those savings in the, you know, and, and the role that companies like ours can play is to take those individual savings as people are preparing for, um, for, for the future and channel them into productive investment. And 
as has already been mentioned, you know, infrastructure is infrastructure investment is part of that, um, but it's but it's a much bigger story. Uh, one of the things that we can do is help develop um, bond markets, equity markets, and alternatives like infrastructure. Um, for example, we were very pleased to work with the government of Vietnam in developing the first long-term bonds, first the, the first 20-year bond, and then because that was a success, soon after the first 30-year bond. Um, and we, we, we obviously are you know, large holders of equities in a lot of these markets. And we're seeing the beginnings of the development of an ASEAN-wide capital market with some initiatives and infrastructure, and that's, that's an area that I'd be very interested to hear people's thoughts on for the future. Um, on, specifically on infrastructure, uh, there's a lot going on. Um, the, the need is obvious in terms of, of, of building energy, uh, water, other utilities for the future, but also um, there are a lot of projects being invested in. We ourselves, we can do it, you know, we, we invest directly in projects as we've re recently done in an energy plant in the, in the Philippines, um, or we can partner with um, multilateral organizations, we've partnered with um, the IFC for a new fund which is targeting uh, infrastructure investment in emerging markets. Uh, and also in, in, in Vietnam, we've also partnered with the uh, CIGF. So th th there is a lot, uh, there are, there are a lot, there's a lot of investment going on that is simultaneously um, able to provide higher returns for savers in those countries um, than bonds, but also is able to meet the, the need, the economic and social need there is in those countries for those investments. So uh, broadly speaking, a, a very positive story, uh, and countries like the UK, as they're thinking about their, their future economic strategy, are, are well advised, and it was encouraging to see the, the Secretary of State say, to think about how it can strengthen its links, our links, with, with some of the fastest growing parts of the world. It's all about putting out your stake and marking a, a flag uh, for the, or flying the British flag out in the region, isn't there? Not given the historical links, there has been a lot of value and friendship that has been put together uh, between the UK and, and ASEAN. I mean, just going back on the investment trends, uh, and you as an institution uh, are helping to cover, together with the IFC, which is, for those of you who don't know, the International Finance Corporation. It's the private uh, investment arm of the World Bank. So there is obviously a mandate to help uh, the, the uh, poorer or, or less able countries move up the ranks much more quickly. So from an investment point of view as, as a business, do you pick out hot spots within the region uh, or do you uh, and have discussions with policymakers to say, you are a part of our you know, top 10 countries we're going to be investing. Of the top 10, you, you, you will be the first. We will roll out um, some, some of these themes. Or, or is it uh, more of a, a business decision? So instead of having necessarily conversations with policymakers first, you, you go straight, you identify the demographics, you identify the market, and then roll out some of your products. I, I know it's a little bit of a tricky question, but I was just going to ask you anyway. It's, a, it's, 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 it's an excellent question. I mean, a, our preference is to have um, is to have the, as much investment as we can in the country where the policies are held, uh, because we are, you know, with, with life and health insurance, you are taking on long liabilities, 10, 20, 30 year liabilities, and you want to have assets matching those liabilities in the same in the same economy. Um, you don't want to be ex exposed to exchange rate risk and, and other risks. So that's that's the ideal. And in in, in, a, in a country like the UK, where we've been for many. You know, for centuries, we've got a, we've got a very large uh, proportion of, of we've got over 60 billion of infrastructure investment. There are challenges to that in 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 um, in developing markets. Um, one of the challenges is um, it can be regulation. Sometimes, actually, the regulatory framework um, requires us to invest in certain assets and not others, and that's a that's a conversation we have, and that and that can be very sensible at, at a stage when the when the industry is developing. Uh, but as it does develop, then then we we want to have that conversation about how you broaden the range of assets that we can invest in. I mean, one of the other issues is, and this is true in the UK just as much as it is in ASEAN, is. If companies like ours find it difficult to deal with political risk around infrastructure projects. You know, we, we, we're very comfortable dealing with commercial risk. That's our job. Um, you know, it, but the possibility that a country will start a big, amb ambitious infrastructure program and then change its mind. And as I say, this happened. This is not. A, you know, this happens in. This happened in Germany, in Spain recently. That's something that that that, that companies find it hard to to deal with. And that's why partnering with organisations like the IFC. 
um, it can be can be helpful because we feel that if if we and they are able to have a dialogue with the with the government and and establish that this really is a strategic priority for the country and it's going to carry on for a, for a long time, uh, and also they can do things like take a sh you know a, a share of the initial uh, risk in, in in the project that can help get more. Um, more private sector money, money in there because it, I mean, in the end, we are an, in, an insurance company, and our, and our customers don't necessarily t expect us to take, uh, you know, the highest levels of risk. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. Some remarkable re remarks. Even though I use my uh, uh, moderator's prerogative to ask some tricky questions there, but ultimately, what we got out of that was that there needs to be a, a general level of flexibility, nimbleness, and an open dialogue. And certainly, so, you know, with the um, ASEAN uh, Business Council here in the ASEAN UK Business Council here in the UK with Kevin Ross and other colleagues, Alan, um, but also with other institutions like the uh, ASEAN Business Advisory Council. I know there is a lot of discussions that happen between the public and private sector, so that openness is basically the critical factor, isn't it? Um, so we'll move on quite swi swiftly uh, to you, then, if I may. Um, so, what are the, some of the you're, uh, you're headquartered in the Philippines, I believe, as I mentioned earlier, but also have local hubs in other parts of the ASEAN countries. What are the drivers for you that you're looking um, as a business? I know you're a non-executive director, so th there are some things you can and cannot say. Maybe you're <coughs> more independent than a typical executive, but give us some of the thoughts, the, the kind of elements of drivers that you're seeing in the region that gives you a real boost, an uplift that makes you get up every morning. I, I get up quite early, so I have no problem getting up regardless, but uh, um, the, your, your Excellencies, uh, Ambassadors, uh, Kevin Watts, uh, and, and other hosts from the UK Asian Business Council, esteemed guests, friends and colleagues, thank you very much for inviting Monde Nissin, with, with, with whom I'm a non-executive director, and, and our local business here in the UK, Corn Foods, along to this event. We're very pleased to be here. Uh, I said that what I'd do, if it's okay with you, is just spend a few minutes telling you a little bit about our business because I'm conscious not all of you will know us and then go on and talk about what we find exciting about the ASEAN region in particular. Uh, so um, my, my, my background originally is with Korn, who, to whom, whom I've worked with for many years, and I was really delighted that His Excellency the High Commissioner for Brunei actually uses our products. They're, they're used in his household and he eats them, as, as does Puno, in fact. So I'm delighted that some of you already know us. Uh, corn is a meat uh, alternative product, protein-based product. Uh, some of you will have heard of a, uh, a gentleman called Lord Rank of Rank Hovis McDougall, which was a very famous um, food company in the UK. And in the 1960s, rather like today, when we've got rapid population growth, in the world, he was a little bit concerned that we would run out of food in, in, in the world and wanted to, and, and, and protein in particular, and wanted to develop a, a, an animal free protein. So he launched a venture um, along with ICI, another famous big uh, chemical and pharmaceuticals company, and many hundreds of millions of pounds later, uh, corn came into being, which is a micro protein, uh, which is created by taking a naturally growing fungi. Uh, adding, I'm simplifying this, adding uh, some uh, glucose, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and some minerals. And this is fermented in a fermenter, rather like beer or bread is made. And the result is corn, which is a paste, which we then harvest and, and, uh, and make that into burgers, sausages. We make it into mince, we make it into chicken pieces, which can be ingredients. And, and ready meals such as steak and kidney pie, the famous British steak and kidney pie, fish pies, and so on. And you can buy these in, in all of the stores. So we have around 65% market share in the meat alternative category in the UK. Um, and uh, we were, the, the business was owned by a private equity house between 2011 and 2015. As private equity houses do, the business was then put out for sale and uh, we had many offers from you know, large US corporations, large European corporations, and also Asian corporations. And the reason we uh, uh, chose to sell to Monde Nissin, of the, as you say, headquartered in the Philippines, was really our values were very similar to those of Monde Nissin. So one of the things about, that there are four unique things about corn. One is that, uh, as well as being meat-free, is that it's, uh, 
very healthy compared to meat products. So uh, Matt rightly talked about the aging population that we have around the world. One of the other phenomenon is that people are getting more obese, unfortunately, as they consume more, more you know, uh, meat and, and other products. Um, and uh, the thing about corn is that it's around 85% uh, less saturated fat, very high in protein, zero cholesterol, and high in fiber. So it's a very healthy protein. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, because I explained of our process of how we make it, we grow it in a fermenter. So we need very little land compared to cattle where you need lots of land, you need lots of water. Uh, and so we have around 90% less uh, greenhouse gas emissions compared to meat productions. Uh, and also, uh, w w cattle, because of what they do naturally, emit lots of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, and we have much less uh, water, uh, land, and environmental impact. So it's very environmentally friendly. And thirdly, I think it's very great tasting. Uh, and also, we have a, a vegan version of the pro vegan versions of the product for those people for religious or ethical reasons can't consume, uh, you know, uh, dairy-based dairy products. Monday Nissin has very similar values. So Monday Nissin is uh, headquartered in the Philippines. It has around a 65% market share of noodles. Uh, some of you will know it, Lucky Me Noodles, in the Philippines where noodles are big. So huge market share, also big in biscuits and cakes. And, uh, but Monday Nissin again has very similar values because one of its key values is to have food security, uh, i.e. making food affordable for the masses to eat. Uh, and our noodles in the Philippines retail at 10 cents per pouch, so they're accessible to everybody. So it's a purpose-based company, very keen on making sure we have food security, very keen to uh, manage the environmental impact. So to make noodles, as you, as you all know, you need a lot of oil, palm oil in particular. So we have actually developed alternative to palm oil so that we mitigate the impact on the environment of what we do. And also we're very conscious of the uh, aging and the uh, health issues that the world faces as the world becomes richer and therefore its appetite for consuming, you know, perhaps less healthy products increases. So corn is obviously a solution to that. So that's why we partnered with Monday Nissin. How has it gone? Um, it, what, what, one, one of the big benefits of, again, partnering Monday Nissin was that it's uh, headquartered in the Philippines, so it's already in ASEAN. The 650 million people that are already there, rising middle class, that was an attractive proposition for us. And what we've done is that since the partnership with uh, Monday Nissin began, we started selling corn and indeed some of our other business uh, products from elsewhere in the group in the Philippines, including um, a, a restaurant chain called Shakey's Pizza. So uh, rather than having pepperoni or chicken pieces on your pizza, you have corn pieces, which give you the same taste, but in a much healthier way. Since that initial success, we have then uh, established a, an ASEAN hub to expand into other ASEAN countries. Uh, so we're now in Singapore, where the product can be bought. We are also in Thailand and in uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. And we hope to get out to the other ASEAN countries in the coming months and years. Of course, it provides us with a platform itself to expand into other uh, Asian countries, more generally India, China, South Korea, etc. Uh, so Monday Nissin uh, has the financial uh, muscle to be able to do that. So this year our sales will be something like, globally our sales will be something like 1.6 billion US dollars. Uh, as well as the businesses I've mentioned, we have businesses in Australia including a healthy juices business. So people from the UK will know Innocent Juices, which is you know, pure juice, nothing but. And we own the same business in, in Australia called Nudie Juices and we're taking that into ASEAN and the other countries. So for us, um, what we found is, as, as has been mentioned by previous speakers, a real appetite for high quality products from overseas, a, a, you know, a, a, a real appetite because of the growing wealth uh, to uh, have products like corn and nudie juices in ASEAN. Uh, we've had uh, significant and very, very um, open cooperation from the authorities in welcoming us, welcoming us to the countries that we're going to. Um, and so, you know, we're very, very pleased with what's happening. 
to show our commitment to ASEAN, we actually relocated our sales and marketing director of 35 years, he was employee number three in the Modernising Group, to go and head up our hub. Um, so, you know, that shows our commitment, but also we've, that's only been given because we've seen commitment from the countries to help us uh, grow our business over there, and we very much value that. Very finally, uh, clearly there are always challenges, uh, and it would be unfair of me not to talk about the challenges. So there are, there's a real one external challenge that I'd like to highlight and one internal challenge. The external challenge is that um, clearly given our business, which is food, we're very concerned about food safety and we have our processes to make sure that our food is safe and is of high quality. We obviously have worked over the years uh, in the Philippines and over here and elsewhere with the food regulators, the food uh, FDA, the food standards agencies. When we enter a new ASEAN market, a new country, we have to go through the whole process again. So there may be an opportunity as, we tr as ASEAN tries to have common regulation to help with issues like that. So it has to be done once and once only. Uh, but again, I have to emphasize that we've had a lot of help and cooperation in that, but that might be a, a way of streamlining things. Uh, the second one is really an internal challenge that we've had. So we, we, we make great products, we, li we like to think, which are market leading in, in the UK and Europe and in, in places like the Philippines. But clearly, as we go into the ASEAN markets and different ASEAN markets, we have to customize the taste of what we do. So again, in our hub, uh, we've recruited a, a food technology, a, a chef, a development team to help us do that, to make sure we get the taste right for the individual markets. So that's our experience so far. Uh, thank you very much, Vijay. I'll be the first to volunteer to help with the taste bud test. Uh, I'm sure you'll find lots of Asians very happy to share views on food. It's the one communing, one of the primary communing factors, uh, as you well know. Uh, maybe a couple of questions, uh, or just the one question. I'd like to make sure that we do open up the questions to the floor to keep this as interactive as possible. And I can see some eager faces. So for those of you wanting to put up a question, uh, house rule is just hand up and a mic will come in your direction. So by all means, uh, oh, get my attention. We'll go into questions in about three to four minutes. Uh, so, so Vijay, if, if I may ask you, I mean, you were talking a little bit about the accessibility of some of your products. And also, before we go into that, actually, thank you so much for giving a, us a good overview of what it looks like to have a JV, a, a partnership, a cross-border transaction and deal with um, between the UK and an ASEAN institution, uh, ins company. I think this is absolutely critical, actually, to, to highlight the ease of doing business. There are lots of challenges. Um, regulation may be one. The, the, uh, there is uh, perhaps more homogeneity that needs to be built in into the region. But frankly, having the opportunity and having success so much so that we're expanding in the region is a testament uh, to the to the kind of uh, trajectory that uh, ASEAN is uh, is taking at the moment. So, talking about the accessibility of some of your products, you mentioned something like ten cents for the for the Lucky Me noodles, uh, very aptly named, by the way. Uh, how is that um, impacting some of your uh, access into other countries? Uh, do you take into consideration that I think it's um, of the ten ASEAN countries, nine still have some kind of percentage of their population? Um, below the poverty line, as determined by the United Nations. So there is that question about poverty, uh, uh, question about wealth in the, in the countries, and uh, Matt picked up a little bit on this earlier, but do you consider as you're rolling out your products, uh, the accessibility element of your products? I know it, this may be a, a bit of a, a <coughs> silly question, but just bearing in mind that actually lots of the population are going to the middle class range, so you may obviously want to consider some products there too, but just some thoughts that would be hugely helpful. No, I think I think that's a very, very, very good question, um, and you know because because we're currently anyway uh, we are private you know we're a private company so we're not listed on any stock exchange so we can make you know financially we can make those decisions we're able to sacrifice profit to satisfy our purpose which is you know food security is one of our key four pillars. So absolutely, as we enter new markets where you know the, there's a, a population that actually can't necessarily afford the price that other people can, we will make that decision and we'll make that very happily. At the same time, we have premium products for those people that want to consume premium products. So, we, so we'd like to think that actually we can help those who are aspiring, but also those who already are there and want to consume premium products. So we'd like to do both. 
Um, I'd welcome feedback, you know, either either now or privately from anybody uh, afterwards on how we can, you know, do even better because we, we recognise we're not perfect. We we like to think that we're addressing both those areas around health and food security, but if we can do it in a better way, please do come and see me afterwards. I'd be only too happy to listen. Very good. Thank you very much to all of my panelists so far. So we're in the final bit um, of, of Q and A. I see. Um, our silvery fox, Richard Graham MP, has just walked in. So we can start the next panel the next few minutes. Uh, but we'll go into Q&A. Boyd, you have a question down there. Just a second row down here, please. Uh, we'll, we'll couple the questions together, bearing in mind that we have about five minutes. So I've got another question down there. Um, Boyd. Boyd McCleary, I used to be UK High Commissioner for Malaysia, and I'm now UK representative with the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce. Um, I was very interested in Matt, in uh, some of the statistics you gave about the opportunities in Malaysia for uh, wealth management. Um, do you think that other UK companies have understood that opportunity? Or are you sitting there alone in the market, very happy that you're uh, in splendid isolation? And if uh, you are in splendid isolation, what can we collectively do to ensure that uh, more companies become aware of those opportunities? Thank you. Next question down there. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Nurul Ihwan. I'm from Indonesia Investment Promotion Centers. So my questions will be for uh, Mr. Matt Kavanagh. So uh, now, you know, the top five of investors in most of ASEAN countries, they are coming from Asia. So Japan, Korea, and then also the last is China. Even now, China is uh, the top uh, three uh, biggest investors in Indonesia. So uh, in general, usually when we hope that the technology investment coming from Europe uh, is a very big hope from our side, but at the same time that they always think that their technology for the ASEAN market especially, the price is too expensive. So in this case then, just only Japan, Korea dominating this product in Indonesia. So what will be your best suggestions to UK companies that they are having technology that we need very much to be uh, delivered to them. So what would be your best suggestions to come into our market? Thank you. Uh, any other questions from, from the floor? Well, in, the, in that case, then, uh, Boyd's question over to Matt, if I may, and the other gentleman's investment promotion question over to you, Vijay, if I may, and then we'll wrap up. Um, yeah, I think, I think the answer is um, we're not alone. Uh, I think a lot of um, UK companies and, and European and, and US are very focused on it. We are pleased that um, we maybe saw the opportunity slightly earlier than most, well before my time, so I have to be grateful to my predecessors. Um, so it, it's, definitely, it's definitely happening and it, it's, an, it's an inevitable result of the, the divergence in growth rates um, in, in Europe and, and ASEAN. And so I think what... what um, those uh, companies are having to build up their knowledge base uh, and build up their experience in the region, so it will take a while, but it's, it's definitely happening. I think the other, the other optimistic thing would be, you know, as, I, as I hinted at in my remarks earlier, to try and build, you know, build a, a, an ASEAN-wide capital market, an ASEAN-wide investment market. I mean, that will be a, a, sl a slow and steady process and should be so, but, but that would definitely attract more uh, inward investors. Um, they'd be, at the margins, more would be, would be attracted by the idea of having a single regional uh, presence and being able to invest across, across ASEAN. That's, that's obviously not true of us. We are, we are based in each market and actually we don't really see ourselves as an inward investor because what we're doing is, is, is channeling the, the, the savings investments of ASEAN citizens into their own economies. Can I can just clarify, were you talking about inward investments into the UK? Into the Indonesia, I believe. Is that right? From, from outside. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So, so I, I, I think Her Excellency summarised this very nicely earlier because, you know, the, the ASEAN countries, uh, it, it is, in terms of a market, it is the third largest market in the world, uh, bigger than the EU, bigger than the States. And therefore, you know, population-wise, the third largest market after India and China. But actually, the proportion of middle classes and the, and the rate at which that is growing is significant. So I think for investors from outside of ASEAN into ASEAN, it is clearly, you know, a big opportunity. And, and that's one of the reasons, you know, that we, we did our partnership. I think um, given the historical links between uh, certainly the UK... Uh, and, and other European territories and uh, ASEAN. Again, I would say that those historic links definitely make it easier 
to do in inward investment and to have that cultural alignment that you need to be successful. So I would say that there is a lot that um, is very positive about investing into ASEAN, not to say that you know, other countries sh uh, should not be invested in, but I think we've, we've certainly found all of our work in, in ASEAN you know, easy to do, we, we've been welcomed, and it's been uh, you know, very successful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, just a 30-second um, final round, if I may, for our contestants uh, on, the, on the stage here. Um, so I have just one question for you. Typically, I suppose, Vijay, you mentioned that you get to bed uh, comfortably. Nothing keeps you up at night. So I thought I'll twi take a different twist on that and say, what gets you to bed at night when you think about ASEAN? So if I may work in uh, initial order, chronologically order. So uh, Your Excellency, what gets you to bed when you think about ASEAN at night? Well, I, I, I think the, the success of ASEAN's integration and um, the, the peace and stability that we have provided, um, the economic growth that we have provided for our people certainly um, you know, puts us very comfortably to bed each night. Um, but just a final point perhaps which might be useful to, to think about, um, that one of the things that is so important about today's meeting is, and we might talk about it um, in the next session, is that the EU has a formal relationship with ASEAN, uh, and one of the many things that you have to think about as you Brexit, well, this should not be a Brexit discussion, is what kind of role UK would want to play um, post-Brexit as well. Um, I think um, thinking about the, the, the comparison between the European Union and, and ASEAN, um, they're obviously very, very different. Um, in each case, um, countries are having to balance uh, the importance of sovereignty with the value of, of cooperation and collaboration. Um, but you know, the big problems that the world if, is facing uh, are, are, are going to need cooperation and collaboration. And so I think regional organisations are going to have a really important place in that. Uh, and, and given the challenges the, the, the European Union is, is facing at the moment, and I'm not just thinking about Brexit, there's many others with the Eurozone and, and, and migration and, and other, other issues, I, I hope that ASEAN can set an example uh, in, in regional cooperation and, uh, to the rest of the world over the, over the years ahead. Sure. Um, so, so I think, you know, if I give two perspectives, one perspective is that the, I think that the great thing about ASEAN, I think, you know, that, that makes me happy when I go to, go to sleep and I think about it is just the can-do attitude. You know, I think that there's a real can-do spirit, can-do attitude and things happen. So I think that's the positive. I think as, you know, just picking up what Matt is saying in terms of some of the watch outs, I suppose, as there's closer integration, um, will be, I think, you know, the lesson I learned from the Brexit vote here uh, from the election result in the States is making sure that, you know, there's inclusive, an inclusive approach to growth and that people don't feel left behind. I think what we could perhaps read from the votes that we've had here, uh, and indeed we're seeing in Catalonia, perhaps in, the Sp in Spain and what we had in the States, is people feeling left out. And I think that creates social, uh, lack of social cohesion and that we know can then create lots of political and then ultimately business uncertainty, which we as business don't want. So that, I think that would be the watch out. So I inclusiveness. So, well, thank you very much to my incredible panel. Um, a round of applause to them and over to you to the next panel, Linda. <laughs> <laughs>